two separate times in the Bible, once in the old, once in the new, there is a very poignant question put to some people. It's a question that we continue to ask through the ages. And it's simply, am I my brother's keeper? In the Old Testament, it was a question God asked to Cain right after he had killed his brother. And God says, where's your brother? And he says, I don't know where he is. My, my brother's keeper. And the implied answer is, you bet. At some point, at a healthy point, at a God-pleasing, ordained point, all of us have to understand that at some point, place in our lives, people have to take priority over anything else. That we are in some way responsible for each other. Yes, I understand about personal responsibility, and I'm all for it. But we were put on this planet for a purpose, a higher purpose than just gathering cash and then cashing out. I'm not really sure God is interested in blessing America's economy if we're not interested in blessing people with it. I'm not sure God is really all that fired up about what we get as opposed to what we're becoming. And so as we close this series, The Great Recovery, The Six Beliefs That Can Rebuild a Nation, I want us to end with this belief that I am in some way that I need to understand, comprehend, and get my, my mind around my brother's keeper. We started with God is for us. If we have God's favor, we don't need much else. If we don't have that, then much else will compensate for. It's one of the reasons we're gathering tomorrow night back here to just to pray. That hope is everything, work is a calling. My money, my blessings make me responsible. It's not all about me. Last week we talked about the seven reasons we serve. You remember that? We used the word reasons, R-E-A-S-O-N-S. And all of you remember those seven reasons why we serve, right? Right? Recenters my life and encourages others. It is a cure for loneliness, right? Sharpens my skills, opens me up to brand new possibilities. Never, 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 never goes unrewarded. And it shows people I'm serious. You're good. <laughs> and so we're going to end it with this idea that I am my brother's keeper. So I want to ask you two questions as we begin the discussion today. And really what we're going to be talking about is the concept of compassion. Can you be a Christian and be apathetic? I mean, I just don't care. It's just about me. Lord, bless me, my wife, us kids, us four, and no more. Get all you can, can all you get, sit on the can and spoil the rest. <laughs> Listen to what Jesus says. So I'm giving a new commandment to you now. Love each other just as much as I love you. Your strong love for each other will prove to the world that you're a Christian. You want to prove to the world that you have a legitimate, authentic faith? Then love, have compassion for people. To be apathetic is not in our vocabulary. I don't care. I don't, you know, people got what they deserve. It doesn't matter. Me, you know. Romans 12 says this, love each other with brotherly affection. And take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy in your work, serving the Lord enthusiastically. Can you be a Christian and be unmovable? Nothing moves you to action. Nothing can convince you to come out of your shell and get out into the marketplace of life where life is lived. Because you've been hurt. You've tried and have failed. Remember this, people will not remember for your failures. What they remember is what you did after you failed. 
But some people are hurt. They just, you know, I'm a Christian. I love God, but I've tried this thing. I've tried to serve, and nobody, you know, responded. I tried to start a business. I tried to do something important. I tried to, I tried to do what I thought I should do, and I failed. I got married, and that didn't work. And all and on and on, the list can go, and I just kind of get back in my shell. It's like those great theologians, Paul, Simon, and uh, Garfunkel. Don't talk of love. I've heard that word before. I'm sleeping in my memory of feelings that have died. I have no need of friendship. Friendship causes pain. I've never, if I'd never loved, I would never have cried. I'm a rock. I'm an island. I have my books and poetry to protect me, shielded in my armor, hiding in my room, deep within my womb. I touch no one and no one touches me. I'm a rock. I'm an island. And that is a lie from the pit of hell. Because this is why you were put on this planet, to love and be loved. And I want to tell you right now, it's something you already know, but I just didn't notice. To love anyone is to open yourself up for great pain. If you don't believe that, get married. I mean, you marry a good woman and she'll hurt you bad, right? She hurt me bad in a real good way. You know that great theologian, Petty Loveless? Kind of ironic, isn't it? Petty Loveless? <clears throat> hey, say so we just, you know, I mean, you, you, you want to you you get real pain? Have kids. I mean, I mean, do anything. Do any. And so what happens is, is because I think a lot of times we've tried. We try to get outside ourselves and love people and help people and make people a priority. And it's failed and we just kind of get back in our shell. This is not an option for a Christian. Keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For some who have, have done this have entertained angels without realizing. Remember those in prison as if you were there yourself. Remember also, also those being mistreated as if you felt the pain in your own bodies. Abraham Lincoln said, I pity the man who can't feel the sting of the whip when it is laid on another man's back. Winston Churchill said that the price of greatness is responsibility. Being willing to step into the gap and with a compassionate heart begin to help God in the process of healing and bringing people back to God's original intention. Compassion. This is what will rule the day. A country of compassionate people loving each other and lifting each other and helping each other and bringing out the best in each other. Right? Wouldn't it be cool? I'm not saying we should do it, so don't get nervous. But I'm just saying, you know. I mean, I think in a few minutes we need to go have lunch and calm down. Don't you? But just theoretically. The second time that Jesus asks this question, or the Bible asks this question, is in the New Testament. And it's in, uh, I'm my brother's keeper. It's in the story of the, of the Good Samaritan, which is an oxymoron, right? Good Samaritan. That's like, that's like saying good Mississippian, right? I mean, just those two things go together. Or good Texan. I mean, or, or, no, I'm just kidding. Come on, lighten up. That was a bad choice of words because those Mississippi boys will cut you. You know what I'm saying? I'm sorry for all the people in Mississippi. I didn't mean that. I'll say, you know, Kentucky because they're wimps. They won't do anything to you up there. Wow. Yeah, he said he is an idiot. Yeah, this is true. I mean, you just understand when the word Samaritan is used, it's not, I mean, these were not people held in high esteem. They were considered to be rednecks, people of low morals, people of low moral fiber. And yet a story is told of a man who goes from Jerusalem to Jericho, and on this journey he is beset, he is uh, mugged, he is robbed and left for dead on the side of the road. A guy, you know, a priest from the temple comes by, and of course he crosses on the other side of the road because we preachers can't be bothered with messy people. Because we're serving Jesus. We got to go to our Bible study. 
Another guy comes by, and the only thing it tells is that he was he worked at the temple, so he was evidently he must have prepared the sacred dish or whatever he did. He at least went over and looked at the guy. And then he went on his merry way. Of course, these two guys had agendas, right? They were going somewhere. These are important people. Then the Samaritan comes along. He not only sees him, he has pity on him. He binds up his wound. Well, let's read it. Then the despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey, which means the donkey was messy with all the blood and the pus and the goo. and ugh. Oh, there was pus. <laughs> the next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins telling him to take care of this man. If the bill runs higher than this, I'm going to, God blesses me. I got plenty of money. Hello? I'll pay whatever else he owes. Not like, does he have major medical? I'm not touching him because there might be liability. Now, which of these three would you say? By the way, this question was asked to Jesus. You need to understand. Go back and read in context. This question was asked in Luke 10 by a religious professional trying to catch Jesus in something he could accuse him of. Now, which of these three would you say was his neighbor? To the man who was attacked by the bandit, Jesus asked. The man replied, this is the religious guy, the one who showed him mercy. Right. Then Jesus said, go and do the same. So if you want to understand how do we live Christianly, here's a great example, that we are to show compassion. This is what will serving compassionately will save our country. And if we can't convince enough people to get off their high horse and get down in the trenches and start serving each other compassionately, our country is doomed. You heard it here. Write it down, put it down. Pastor Foster said we're doomed. <laughs> yep, that's what I said my story and I'm sticking to it. But lest you think that we are at a place we've never been, the world has been on the edge of doom nation for a very long time. And I think it's only the grace of God that has held us back. And God's people who are called by God's name need to stand in the breach and be God's people and expect God to respond. So let's talk about what compassion looks like. How do you understand this big idea? Because a lot of people have a hard time with compassion because some of us think, well, compassion is just being soft and encouraging people to be lazy. And if that's what you think compassion is, you are in for a wonderful discovery. Because that's not what compassion is. So let me just give you some, suggest, some thoughts about this. Compassionate people, first of all, have their priorities in order. Here's what I mean. People who are truly compassionate understand that people matter most. You know why? Because they matter most to God. People matter most because they matter most to God. And if they matter most to God, then they better matter most to me. People matter most to God, and therefore they matter most to me. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort in his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only on his own interests, but also the interests of others. That's the definition of business. 
obsessively, compulsively preoccupied with the needs of others. Let me, I'm not Arthur Laffer or any economist that I can predict your financial future and your business. If your business doesn't exist to help people, you are in a bad business. If you're trying to milk, manipulate, or some, some other ways take from people, so you can enrich yourself and impoverish them, you are in a business doomed for failure, and you will be exposed. Emerson said it this way, it's one of, the, one of the most beautiful compensations in life that no man can sincerely try to help another without helping himself in the process. If people aren't your priority, then your priorities are out of whack. People who are compassionate understand that my agenda, my computers, my agenda, my sound machines, my guitars, my drum kits, my, 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 all the stuff, all the tools we have serve the purpose of loving, helping, serving, healing, lifting, blessing people. I get really sick. I love Nashville. But there are some people who come here and make me want to puke. <laughs> and the people who come in, I just come here to, I just come here to do my thing. My, I'm going to make my music, make my art. Well, go home, Bubba. We don't need any more people like you. <laughs> we got enough people here trying to make their music, and they suck at it. <laughs> now, if you want to spend your life creating art, that inspires and moves and motivates, yeah, stay here. There's plenty of room for you. Let me just say this. There ain't no prophet nor the son of a prophet. But there will always be room for great men and women who write and create great music and great art and great literature who are inspired by the heart of God for the love of their fellow man. Yeah. Amen. Amen. You know the music I get gravitated to? I, I'm, I'm, I was just in this song this morning. I've never been a Brooks and Dunn fan, but I'm kind of gravitating to other music. I was listening this morning. Ain't, ain't nothing about you that don't do something for me. Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> I bought it. <laughs> then I bought another Brooks and Dunn song last week called Proud of This House We Built. Ever heard that? I never heard that in my life. I don't listen to those people, bunch of rednecks. I don't <laughs> care for. Them. So trust me, I, will, I don't care who you are. I like you or not, I'll buy your music if you move me. Yeah. If you if you give me some sense that you understand what I'm going through and you have sympathy and connectedness to it, you wouldn't. You know what I'm saying? Compassionate people. Get it. They know they have the right priority. Their music, their art, their business, their economy is focused to the hurts and the pain of men and women, finding them there and but not leaving them where they found them. Compassionate people not only have their priorities in order, they have, I think, a God-given capacity for mercy. There are some people who are just hard. They're just hard. They're, dri they're driven hard. And, and somehow inside of them, there is, this, there is this thing that they've not allowed to grow and get out. And that is capacity to have pity and mercy and compassion on other people. Psalm 103 says this, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how they are formed, and he remembers that they are dust. Amen? You didn't marry a perfect person. You married a wounded, messy person. God understands they're made of dust. God understands. You remember when we stand and we get married and we tell, I'll love you forever through better for worse. You didn't know how much worse was going to be instead of better, right? Richer and poorer, and now it's been more poorer and a little richer. And you say, I didn't sign up for this. Yes, you did. <laughs> That's the point. Divorce Bubba and you'll marry Bubba's twin. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Gee whiz. 
we were sitting around last night. Our, my, our oldest daughter, Erin's birthday was Friday, and so we were having a birthday party at our house. And around our house was my sweet wife, our three daughters, three guys. I have no idea where these guys came from. <laughs> I don't really like any, any of them <laughs> much. And then our two little puppies. Puppies, yes, men, go away. <laughs> well, I'm just sitting here, I'm just thinking, you know, we're just laughing, having fun, talking about our birthday memories and all this stuff. And I just thought, I just thought about how, over the years, how many times I came paper-thin clothes to walking out of my marriage. I know you've... That's never happened to any of you. But I didn't. And I trust me, I know there are thousands of times Paula, wanted, Paula said she'll never leave me, murder, but leaving me, no. <laughs> I thought if you leave, I'm going with you wherever it is. <laughs> but I somehow inside the capacity of a Christian is a heart of understanding, mercy. You see, all of us need mercy. See, here's the problem. We all need to be loved most at the point where we deserve it the least. That's why you got to be a strong brother and sister in Christ so you have something to give the people in your life. Mercy and grace are two of God's very best gifts, and they're nothing alike. Mercy and grace are not the same thing. You do understand that, right? Mercy is when God withholds from me what I've earned. When we give people mercy, we're saying, you know what? You hurt me. You let me down. You made a promise and you broke it. But I have enough capacity in my soul to understand your humanness and to forgive you and to not lower the hammer. I love what George Washington Carver says. He says, how far you go in life depends on you being tender with the young, compassionate with the aged, sympathetic with the striving, and tolerant of the weak and the strong because someday in your life you will have been all of these things. Amen. Here's what I've learned. What you give people when they're down and you're up is what they'll give you when you're down and they're up. Huh? You scream and you judge and you criticize people who work for you. When your butt gets sent to the door, they won't have any compassion for you. They will only have contempt. Because that's all you sow. We reap what we sow. In a good way, you show mercy and people will give you mercy. Compassionate people also can be bothered. When I read this great Samaritan, the Good Samaritan story, that has been the, the one, I mean, I've heard people preach on this, and man, you know, the metaphors and all the stuff. The only thing that really just stands out to me is the priest, I can understand. You know, he's, he's going somewhere. He's going to preach a revival. He's going to do something great for God. He can't be bothered, this messy one person. The other guy is saying, well, he got an agenda. The Samaritan probably had an agenda, don't you think? He probably had somewhere he had to be. He probably had people depending on him. And yet he could be bothered. If you can be bothered, here's what it seems to me. If a person who can be bothered is a person who understands the concept of margin. If you're always here, people say, well, I'm just living on the edge. Really? What for? It ain't fun. You fall off more times than you, than you sit on the razor's edge. Can I hear an amen? We need margin. This guy had some margin in his life. He had some money margin, right? He paid for the guy to be to take it care of. He had some resource margin because he could put him on his donkey. He, had, you know, he poured wine in his wounds. Don't you know he cried when he did that? 
<laughs> uh, you know, I don't know. I'm just thinking, I'm from Kentucky, For, forgive me. But it could be, you know, I just don't have time for that. I don't have time to come to the ladies together. I'm just, or to the guys thing. I don't have time to come to the prayer tomorrow. I'm busy, 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 busy. You're too busy. If you can't be bothered, if you can't, you know, if your schedule can't be set aside for something more important, then maybe that is your problem. Compassionate people understand priority. They, compassionate people understand, have a capacity to show mercy. Compassionate people can be bothered. Here's another one. This is going to hurt a little bit, but let me go ahead and say it. Compassionate people, Christians, never, 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 did you hear me? What did I say? Never belittle or bully. Try to show as much compassion as your father does. Never criticize or condemn or it will come back on you. Aren't you thankful to God that the Bible is hard to understand and totally irrelevant to your life today? I mean, I don't know anyone who's had... This temptation, duh. I have heard, and I'm afraid I've been one of them, people who proudly stand up and call themselves, I'm a Christian. I love God. Bless God. We don't need to put the flag back in the, in the schools and the prayer in the schools and stuff like that. Ten commandments back in the courtroom. And those same people will cuss their wives and their children. God have mercy on your soul, brother. How can two those things live together? I'm so interested in God and so interested in my country, loving God and pledging to the flag, and yet we are so toxic and painful in the way we treat people. How can this be? How can I call myself a man of God and disrespect and belittle my wife ever? You say, well, what are you talking about? Hey, boys, I didn't fall off the turnip truck today. I've heard men talk to their wives like I wouldn't talk to my dog. About their children. I heard them I heard them cuss and use language that a sailor would blush if he heard. Can we so call ourselves Christians and use our words so destructively? Words create worlds. You do know that, right? Mark Twain, that great theologian, said the difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between lightning and the lightning bug. Maybe some of us are creating poverty in our lives by the poverty of the words we are using. Go easy on others. Then they'll do the same for you. I mean, how practical is that? Right? These are the words of Jesus. Jesus says, listen, never criticize, never condemn. Yeah, but you know, they, but my wife won't do what I want her to do. Well, then tell her what you need and negotiate something with her. She's a good woman, right? My husband, he's a bonehead. Well, have you ever told him what you need? Well, no, he's supposed to know because he loves me. Well, grow a brain. <laughs> Ladies, we cannot read your mind. Hello? Tell us what you need and give us six months to think about it. <laughs> I didn't say that, did I? <laughs> Compassionate people believe that everyone needs to be loved. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual, restore him gently. I tell you what, I, I just, I'm just, just because I'm a Christian 
doesn't mean I agree with everything the Bible says. That's one of the things I'd just soon cut out. Because that's lethal right there. Boy, that's kryptonite. First of all, who among us are going to stand up and say, I'm so spiritual and I'm so on top of my life that I can help you straighten out yours? Yeah, right. Yeah, what else are you selling? But if someone is caught in a sin, here, let's just talk about this in theory, okay? Theoretically, here's the deal. We are supposed to be growing and, and, and vital and vibrant, compassionate, so that if any of us fall by the wayside and do something really stupid, Instead of going over and saying, there's my Christian brother. He did a bad thing. Someone hand me the gun. <laughs> Boo! Now at least he's in heaven and he won't embarrass Jesus anymore. <laughs> you would be shocked at some of the things Paul and I hear. How are you today? Fine, I'm glad to see you. This is our first time, really. Man, I'm glad. How'd you hear about the church? Well, I've been going to X church, and my husband left me, and I found out that last week the elder said that I was no longer welcome. Now, you think I just made that up? Nope, I didn't. I wish I had. I wish I was a liar and you could call me one, but that's happened more than once, hasn't it? That's some of the better things we hear. Listen, you may embarrass me, but I will always love you, period. You think this is hard? This is impossible without God. Loving each other? I mean, you think it's hard to love you? It's hard to love my wife? It's hard. You want to get hard? Have kids. How do you love your kids well? This is what compassionate people do. This is what, how the world gets changed. By understanding that my wife, my children, my brothers, my sisters, those who have failed me most still need to be loved. Can you love someone who's wounded you? If you can, then how do you call yourself a Christian? You say, yeah, but, yeah, I do. I understand. Thank God that we don't have to be consistent. Thank God hypocrites can go to heaven <laughs> along with all dogs. Amen? <laughs> Lastly, compassionate people understand why they're here. They have some kind of compass in themselves that constantly keeps them centered. That they're here serving God's purpose. Acts 13, 36 says this, And David served God's purpose in his generation, then he died. The timeless and the timely. Make sure nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other and everyone else. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Don't put out the Spirit's fire. Let me close with this little story. A man fell into a pit and couldn't get out. Okay? A man fell into a... A man fell into a pit. Thank you. A Pharisee said... Only bad people fall into pits. Amen? Yes. A mathematician came by and calculated how he fell into the pit. A news reporter came by and wanted an exclusive story about how it is to be in a pit. A fundamentalist came by and said, you deserve the pit. A scientist came by and calculated the pressure necessary pounds per square inch to get him out of the pit. A geologist came by and told him to appreciate the rock strata of the pit. <laughs> a building inspector came by and said, do you have a permit for that pit? 
professor came by and gave him a lecture entitled The Elements of Pits. <laughs> an optimist came by and said, things could be worse. <laughs> a pessimist came by and said, things will get worse. Jesus came by seeing the man in the pit, took him by the hand and lifted him out of the pit and set him on his way. I want to be Jesus. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that we will not be pit judge. That we'll not look at other people and say, where did you come from? What did you do? How did that happen? How did you fail? How many times you've been married? What did you do to that job? You got fired? You did what? 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 Shut up. God, help us to have compassion for each other, if nothing else, for our families. Father, help us love this world the way you do it, as it is. It is stinky and messy and painful and sometimes very dangerous. And yet our lives are hidden in you. And we go out now into this world to live for you, to serve in your name, to show compassion with our words, our deeds, and our attitudes. May we ever be like Jesus. Amen. Go get them.